Welcome to the Charlene Show. Now, please help me welcome our host, God's woman, Charlene Singleton. Thank you. Thank you. day that the Lord has made and we're going to have an awesome time today because today's show is a show that is filled with hope. No matter where you are, you can have a hope for tomorrow. A couple of weeks ago, I had an awesome woman of God named DeAndrea McCargo and she came on and shared her book, There's Still More to Your Story. Well, today, we're going to look at the before and the after. And we're calling this today the other side. Because on the other side of pain, on the other side of disappointment, on the other side of discouragement, on the other side of unforgiveness, on the other side of things that happen to you that you would have never thought that leave you devastated is hope. Because there's still more to your story. So join me in a moment. Call all your friends um, because after this commercial, you're going to hear from this awesome woman, DeAndrea McCargo, and her story we're talking about before and after. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. You've been asking for it, and now it's coming. On Saturday, August 6th at 5 p.m., our own Loveland Mail Praise Team will be bringing it home with a special evening of gospel worship. Prepare yourself for an evening of good old gospel music that will glorify God and bless your soul. Join us on Saturday, August 6th at 5 p.m. at our Fontana campus for this wonderful event. We'll see you then. how to make ways with the Lord. If you weren't there, here's what you missed. Trust God and He's your lifesaver. I learned about purpose.
If you thought that was great, don't miss our next event. Funday Sunday on July 31st. Well, welcome back. I have with me a wonderful woman of God who has a story. You never know a person's story until you take the opportunity to sit down with them. And it's amazing. Her name is DeAndrea McCargo, but she's known as Dee Dee. <laughs> and, yeah. and even though I don't know if I had a name like DeAndrea, I think I'd make everybody call me DeAndrea. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes, because oh, I you. love your name. Your thank name you is so, much. so beautiful. Thank you. But, you know, it's amazing because people do have a story. Yes, they do. And the first time I met you, you were doing my granddaughter's uh -huh. hair. Uh -huh. And I had no idea yeah. in a year or so that we would meet. I'd have the opportunity to hear your story oh, wow. and then actually have the privilege and the honor to interview you. So we're talking about before and after. And I want to take a moment because everybody um, that's watching today will not have had the opportunity to hear our first interview. Right. And so um, can you, well, I want to read something from your book first. Okay. I want to read something from your book and then uh, you can, you can, then we'll go from there. Okay. You said some things in life only happen once and do-overs aren't an option. Life is not a number two pencil with a ready eraser. It's a Sharpie with black ink that bleeds through the pages if you're not careful. As much as I wanted to rewrite my history, the pages had gone to print. And then you said a couple of other things in this book. <laughs> I, I am, I'm just still fascinated uh, from your book. Thank and you. actually, I'm going to let you tell them a little bit of your story. Okay. And then I'm going to say a couple of things from your <laughs> book. So tell, tell our audience a little bit about your story. So I wrote Steel, um, number one, as an act of obedience. I had just entered cosmetology school, and two weeks into school, I was having lunch. And I heard the spirit say, I want you to write a book about the last seven years of your life. And I didn't know what that meant. I was like, well, let me think about the last seven years. So I started doing the math, thinking back. And what he was actually saying was, I want you to write a book about the years that I made you complete and made you whole. Mm -hmm. And we know that seven represents the number of completion. And so after hearing that, I started praying and God just took me back to my childhood and things that I had experienced that I didn't talk about. Um, some things that I just needed to empty myself of for me to become the woman that he wanted me to be. And so I started journaling and then I was actually journaling before he told me that, but when I went back to read my journals, I actually saw that I had been technically writing the pages of my book. Oh, wow. And so it took me a long time to actually put those words into the mm -hmm. book still, but it's available now and my heart's desire is for women my age, younger and older, to, to be healed, to be set free and delivered because life is hard. And sometimes you feel like you're the only one going through what you're going through. Mm -hmm. And I felt that way um, through my story, through my life, coming from parents who had divorced and dealing with things in school, battling with my identity, battling with who I was in God and, and comparing myself to my peers. And so it was a, a 10 year, Fan of just trials and trying to overcome and figure out who is DeAndrea, who did God make DeAndrea, and you'll, you know, if you haven't read the book, then you'll definitely well, find out. you know what, <laughs> everybody, you need to read this book because part of your story, mm -hmm. as you put in this book, was how the enemy tried to kill, steal, and destroy yes, you on every level, mm -hmm. starting when you were seven, when you were molested by a babysitter, mm -hmm. You were raped, yeah. Um, and you know, with this Roe versus Wade, we don't have Listen. time to get into that today. Not I might that's have a to have another segment. I might seriously. Where I'm gonna have to have you come back with okay. this because people need to hear that's that part of your story. Yes, ma'am. Um, but being raped and um, and then you you hiding, keeping everything in, yeah. mm -hmm. and finally you get to the place where you are ready to, you said you were carrying hundreds of pounds of pain. Yeah. And there are a lot of people out there right now that are carrying pain and they don't know the healing 
process. The process it takes is the first cry. Yeah. And so one of, and you know, we ended the, my segment with you last time uh -huh. with this, because <laughs> I just love this, and I, I'm not going to cry today. I cried no, when cry. I read don't it. Cry. When I read this book and I read this, uh, so there came a time in your life where you were ready to just open up, let go. You knew you needed to tell somebody mm -hmm. what was going on in your life. And you also talk in your book about how, as a teenager, you were totally acting out. Oh, yeah. I had attitude. I was angry, but it was rooted in anger. It was rooted in anger. And a lot of times you don't know the root of your issues. And so they're masked behind. Um, some people are funny, you know, some people are quiet. For me, it was literally anger. Like I had an attitude with everybody, teachers, parents, friends, and it caused me to be isolated, you know, cause people didn't really know how to handle me, how to deal with me. And so for a long time, I was just really a loner by myself, but I realized the perception that others had of me was not true. And I didn't want that to be my reputation. And so literally again, going back to finding out who is DeAndrea outside of anger, outside of hurt and depression and disappointment. Who is she? And it literally took God and he was pulling on me and I didn't realize it, you know, but when I was really sick and tired, I was like, okay, God, I know this is you. And mm -hmm. I literally just fell in my room on the floor and I had to surrender. I, I, I you, you know, you said I had damaged relationships everywhere as a result of brokenness mm -hmm. masked by, by a, a bad, bad attitude. attitude. Yes. But then you go on and you say, I was finally ready to let it all go. I could no longer carry the weight of my past. And that's for somebody today. This is why you need to get this book. You're not alone. No matter how dark your past, no matter how painful your past, yeah. you can have a better future. And anyhow, you go on and you say, I, it was just too much to bear. Te tears were the only language I had, but thankfully it was all I needed. Buckets of water fell down my face as I released every painful experience I had ever known. I cried for my six-year-old self who watched her family be torn apart. I cried for the nine-year-old who was violated in her own home. I cried for the 13-year-old too afraid to fight for her virginity. And for the 14-year-old who was too naive to believe a stranger would actually give her a ride home. I cried for the 16-year-old who let a fairy tale relationship drive her to an abortion clinic. I cried for the 10 years of broken relationships with my mother and the decade of whispers about my family. I cried for being silent when I should have spoken up and for not using my own voice. And I seriously, I could get on this show and read your whole book, but I, I, I love I love the fact that you put the before yeah. in a book. Mm -hmm. I love that. But you know what? I want to talk about the new story. Listen, let's oh, talk about it. Let's, let's talk, talk about, about it. Let's talk about the new <laughs> story. So first of all, I just said when I first met you, I had brought my eldest granddaughter yes, to you. My good friend, Michelle. Uh -huh. My granddaughter had come down, and it was a Saturday. Yep. And I looked at her hair. He was like, oh, no. I, I'm like, oh, no, 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 because I'll have to tell people, don't you tell anybody who you're a Gigi is. <laughs> so I called my good friend, Michelle Sanchez, and I'm like, Michelle, I need somebody to do uh, my my granddaughter's hair, yeah. and, and I need it done today. Cause yeah, tomorrow, like right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and she gave me your number, she and did. you just, and I know for a hairstylist on a Saturday. Yeah. But you fit us in. I did. So tell tell us a little bit about your, you're a hairstylist. Tell us yes. about that. So I'm a hairstylist um, by trade, um, licensed, and I've been in business. Me and my dad actually have a salon together because he's a barber. But again, if you read the book, you'll find out how I got to cosmetology school. And so it wasn't something I was passionate about as a kid. I didn't think it would be my profession but I kind of see why God has called me to this industry because beauty and identity, I feel like they go together. And as a black you know, woman, it's something, our hair is something that's precious to us. It's something that for years we've abused. We've tried to you know, make it work and fit the culture or fit our job or fit everybody else's description and depiction of beauty. And so I wanted to 
um, help black women, you know, little girls who look like me, embrace who they are, their culture, their skin, their hair. And, and, and with what I do, I meet different women, you know, every day. Like, my day is packed, jam-packed yes. with yes. women. Women I know, women I don't. And so it's a beautiful, you know, job and career to have. And I just want people to know that beauty is that I say, Beauty is a is an inner possession with an outward expression, and so our that. beauty is something that starts here, and then we express it, you know, with how we style our hair, or how we wear our clothes, or yes. how we do our makeup. But beauty is the heart thing, and so once you get your heart right, and you see beauty on the inside, then everybody will see it on the outside. I I, I love that. We had a God's Women's Conference. I believe it was our third God's Women's Conference, mm -hmm. and the theme was God's beauty radiance radiates from the inside out absolutely and that's what you're saying and that's what i see beautiful a beautiful woman Thank you. and i know the other thing that i other reason i believe oops, that god brought you to that industry is because seriously hairstylists are therapists yes ministers therapists prayer partners secret keepers yes <laughs> they're yeah it's a lot and you have to be wise I feel to be a hairstylist because you know we hear about hairstylists being you know gossipers and things like that but I feel like a good hairstylist is somebody that you can trust somebody that you can fully be vulnerable with it's a, it's a lot of power in that chair there's a <laughs> lot of power a lot of healing yeah um you know that um Michelle's twin Michael mm -hmm. um is a hairstylist Absolutely. he did my hair for years and um we had church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, oh, yeah. I, every time I went there, I knew Michael and I would be talking like four, five sermons. So beside the fact that you are, you said a minister, because you are pouring in yeah. encouragement. And the other thing, um, D.D., and this is what I told women once a long time ago at God's Women's Conference, and this is why I'm so glad to be interviewing a woman of God yeah. that has Jesus in their hearts, because... When you guys are washing hair, mm -hmm. you're literally laying hands yes, on somebody. And I tell people all the time, you need to be careful who's laying hands on yes, you. Yes, ma'am. And uh, I can just look at you and know, I, I can seriously just see you <laughs> praying over somebody. Oh, it happens. Because it's a. I feel like it's a spiritual thing. Our hair okay. is definitely spiritual. And so I'm even... I'm even careful about clients that I've accepted. The older I've gotten and the more I've gotten into my career, I can't accept everybody, and I'm okay with not accepting everybody. Because <laughs> it's, <laughs> so. not, it's not just who you're laying hands uh -huh. on, it's who's it's in that chair. It's a transfer. Chair. So I love when, we, when you and I have talked, and mm -hmm. you've talked about um, not just loving yourself and loving your natural hair, but women having hair goals. Mm -hmm. And I know you help women with those goals if they wanted their hair. What are some of the goals that women could have with their hair? Some people want long hair. They okay. want healthy hair. They want thicker hair. Okay. Um, I equate hair health to habits and hormones. Ooh. Those two things kind of determine what your hair can or can't do. And so for me, for example, I have fine hair, curly hair. It's not super thick. It's not thin, but I can't press it. If I press my hair, it does not last. And so okay. I, even as a hairstylist, had to learn what my hair can and can't do and be okay with that. Be okay with this is the type of hair the Lord gave me. I'm going to love it anyway. And the health of it comes within knowing the parameters of what it can take and embracing that. And so I help women just really love their hair and also love themselves. And love themselves. Yeah. And I know that you teach women all that and how to take care of their hair. And I know you're really, really full with your schedule. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> are you taking any new clients? Um, well, okay. Yeah, answer. So, right, it's really case by case. Okay. It really just depends on the situation. Um, my schedule is really full, and I don't want to say that I can take somebody, and then I'm not able to then fulfill. Then you're not able to. So they can check. Yes. They so can yes, call. can absolutely call can, and check. Can, yeah. Can we? So you're, as as you all see, her number is showing on the screen. So um, uh, DeAndrea, DD, McCargo, her number is calling uh, on the screen, and you can pray. <laughs> Yeah, hope and pray. And then call her. <laughs> you can pray and call and see if she can fit you in. And so we're going to go to a commercial. 
And then we're going to come back to the other good part Ooh. of your story. <laughs> so you guys stay with us, call your friends, and we'll be right back after this commercial. You've been asking for it, and now it's coming. On Saturday, August 6th at 5 p.m., our own Loveland Mail Praise Team will be bringing it home with a special evening of gospel worship. Prepare yourself for an evening of good old gospel music that will glorify God and bless your soul. Join us on Saturday, August 6th at 5 p.m. at our Fontana campus for this wonderful event. We'll see you there. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. We're here with Deandra, <laughs> Deandria McCargo and Elder B. McCargo. We're going to talk to them because we're talking about part two of her story. We're, we're going from her book, Still, There's More to Your Story. And a few minutes ago, we talked about how from a young age, her story really was dim. But you know what? No, once again, no matter how dark your past, you can have a spotless future. You can have a great future. Because on the other side of pain, on the other side of disappointment, on the other side of discouragement, is the power of Jesus. And the power of Jesus leads to the greatness of Jesus. So, Elder McCarga. Hey, Elder. Yes, yes. It was, I, I'm so grateful to have you here. I'm honored. Um, with your beautiful wife. And uh, Elder, I know your name is Elder B, but there's a name in there too. B. Alexander McCarga. Elder B. Alexander McCargo. Yes. Wow. And so... Um, we know that God blessed Dee Dee. In spite of her painful years growing up, mm. he blessed Boy. her with a, not just any old husband, he blessed her <laughs> with a wonderful husband. That's <laughs> her words. And my, uh, our friend Michelle mm. um, Sanchez has said that your wedding was like the best wedding she's <laughs> ever <laughs> attended. But before we get to the wedding, talk to me and tell me, how did that happen? How did y'all, wait a minute. I'm going to give this to Elder. <laughs> How long have you guys been married? We It will be two years in August. August what? August. Steve. Okay. Well, so you're two years. I'm going to ask you that in eight more years. And <laughs> okay. I, wanna, I still want to remember that August the 8th. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Indeed. So um, how did you guys meet? Oh, we, have, we have two different versions. <laughs> I tell the truth. She, she, okay. She, <laughs> she, yeah. Anyway, we've known each other, um, you know, from the you know, uh, church scene as far as, you know, different churches, what have you, mutual respect. Um, and then um, time went on, you know, life happened. She had her, you know, things going on. I had mine. And then um, uh, by the blessings of social media, we were friends there and kind of kept up with each other's moves and stuff like that and paid attention, very close attention to certain things that were happening. He was playing, paying very close attention. <laughs> To what was happening in your life? Yeah. Okay. okay. So I can yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, asked, she asked me to tell. Yeah. No, yeah. But so, she's just saying, tell the truth and shame the devil. Yeah. Okay. The okay. Whole That's truth. all she said. The whole truth. <laughs> anyway, uh, I noticed that basically that she was, you know, single, but I was still. It wasn't anything of, you know, trying to yeah. get with her. It was right. just a thing. Of, yeah. And so one day, uh, she happened to go to New York uh, for um, New Year's Eve, and she happened to be taking pictures. And she took a picture on sitting on the steps of a brownstone in New York City. Okay. And I thought the I thought the picture was dope. So she thought I was dope. Yeah, that too. <laughs> you I just might have like, to explain to our, our audience she, what I dope thought is. That she was beautiful. Beautiful. She, she thought it was a nice photo. It was a very nice photo. Okay. So I went into her direct messages and I said, "What are you doing in my city?" And so she said, oh, I didn't know you was from here. And I and didn't. So in passing, I always knew he was swaggy. And that means, like, he was cool. He was yeah. smooth. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, um, but I didn't put together that it was, like, New York swag. So when he said that, I was like, oh, that makes sense. Okay. Why, you, why you move the way you move. Yeah, okay. So, we, so after that, well, it was ironic. Um, 
so New Year's passed. Okay. Um, that following week, I, uh, I, was, uh, I had to go and minister at a church. Um, to, I had to go sing. And um, it was a church in the middle of a neighborhood in San Bernardino. And if you wouldn't have known the church was there, you wouldn't have, you know, you would have lost, you would have been right. lost. But at any rate, I walk and in lost. and she was there. And he and, was uh, nowhere on the flyer. I so was nowhere on the flyer. He was asked to go minister at the church. At the last minute, that morning. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you were morning. a fill in. Right. It okay. Was, well, basically, you know, basically they that's what I call it when right. somebody calls me today. They called me. They called me. Like, they they called me it, was a, it, was a, it was a Wednesday. They okay. called me and they said, hey, so can you come and sing before the preacher preaches? Okay. Yeah. Wow. So I said, let me see if I can get my crew together, got them together. We made our way there. Um, and, and so uh, while that's happening, I got p tagged in a flyer with 99 other people. And after coming back from New York, I hadn't gone to church. Oh, so okay. I was like, well, let me go to church tonight. So he was there. I was there. Can I pick up from here? You, you tell the long version. I'm okay. So he was there. I was there. He <laughs> says that when he saw me in the good, audience. Good obedient husband. <laughs> <laughs> He said that when he saw me in the audience, he was like, is that her? No, that's not her. She's still in New York, but she's back from New York. So he went through this whole mind thing in his head. He sang, and afterwards, he slid into my DMs again. And um, he said, I you know, didn't get to hug you or you know, speak to you. And I was like, well, I'm on my way to grab me some dinner before they close. He met me up there in the parking lot, and we found out that we both lived in Upland on the same street, five bikes apart from each other. Yep. And so wow. we, you know, exchanged numbers and then started kind of just communicating or seeing each other just real casual because I had a busy schedule. He had a busy schedule. Yeah. And for like a year and a half up until he moved to Houston, it was just, hey, I'm off today. Can I, you know, can I come see you? Want to come by? Can I cook you dinner? Because like I said, our schedules were really busy. Mm -hmm. um, and he ended up moving to Houston. Found out or realized he was in love with me. <laughs> okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want you to stop. Okay. And I want him to pick that up from me. Oh, the okay. so, part? Yeah, so I did, and when I left, to move, I moved to Houston, took on a, a ministry assignment there, and uh, and in my mind, I was going to Houston, start my life over. Start over, that's what he said. I'm that's going to Houston, start, start over. my life over. <laughs> okay. I didn't have any ties to, you know, anyone, serious ties, anyone, so I was like, okay, it's whatever. So I got to Houston, and then I was like, I'm in love with this girl. <laughs> and it, it was the craziest thing because she just constantly stayed on my mind. And Aww. it was just, you know, and I'm, we would go out, friends, we'd go out little places or whatever. And then I would find myself coming back home and hopping on the phone and talking to her until she falls asleep. <laughs> so, um, and then, um, so after that, my birthday came around in September. And um, I snuck back into California. I didn't tell anybody it was coming, and she took me um, to to dinner um, for my birthday. Uh huh. And um, she bought me a very nice gift, <laughs> and I was like, and there's a backstory to the gift, but that's a whole nother thing. Right. I but anyway, uh, bought me a nice gift, and I was sitting there, and I had a conversation with myself, and I said, "What are you doing? Why are you playing?" I said, "Why are you playing?" I said, "You you got a good thing here. Why are you playing?" So I looked up at her, and I said. We're together. Yeah. And she said, okay. He didn't give me a note that said, will you be my girlfriend? Mm -hmm. Yes, no, maybe. I just he said, just told me I said, that we're together. together. And she said, okay. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. I said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I'm too old for a girlfriend. Uh -huh. And okay. she said, did say that. okay. That's and awesome. so after that, that was like a, un, that was a, uh, unofficial, unofficial proposal, proposal to <laughs> yeah, a degree. Unofficial so, proposal. Yeah. And, then, and then, like I said, then still, even after that, everything just happened so organic. Yeah. It was never, oh, we got to stop and do this and blah. And then, and she's a planner. So she started making little whatevers and, and then the pandemic hit. Yeah. Um, and so that, you know, we thought that was going to, well, they kind of put a, you know, little change or alteration. But at any rate, uh, we got married. Um, we had a, a beautiful wedding. Um, 60, COVID. 60 guests, and it actually turned into a worship experience. Yeah, it did. Well, I can and, only imagine. And, and, and um, we actually, uh, it was people, you know, laid out, laying hands, the whole nine, and no one contracted COVID. Yeah. And it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful wow. experience, and it, it wasn't intentional. Wow. It wasn't intentional. I was sitting there, we was at the table, and we had planned to sing to each other at oh, the yeah, wedding. Oh, yeah, we did. And so while it was in the hustle and bustle of things, and we were just sitting there, and I was talking I to was somebody. I was in the middle of biting a good old chunk of my food, and he said, I got to sing to you right now. It was just like something yeah, hit him. I said, I got to sing you right now. And she was like, huh? I said, I got to sing you right now. And I put a chair in the middle of the floor. I started singing. 
Next thing you know, that thing turned, and God dropped on us. Yeah, he and came was in. Like, uh oh. <laughs> yeah, so it was. It got pretty wow, bad. Wow, I see why bad. Michelle said that. Yeah, it got pretty the bad. The worship experience. Yeah. So. Well, you know what? In a moment, we're gonna. I mean, we're gonna go to commercial break. Okay. Because we know that you are a worship leader, and I want to talk to you. We want to pick your mind about <laughs> worship and praise. So once again, we're going to be right back in a moment. Call all your friends. I am here, and I'm going to use their nicknames, mm -hmm. okay? I'm not going to say DeAndrea and Elder B. Alexander McCargo. <laughs> She's known as DD, and he said we could call him B. B. So B and D. So, <laughs> so stay right there with us, and we're going to be right back. and DeAndrea McCargo, and we've been talking to them about their story, about the befores and afters. And, uh, you know, the Word of God says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. In other Absolutely. words, it doesn't say the weapons won't come. Absolutely. Right? It just says they will not accomplish that which the enemy sent them to do, right. to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's where the enemy came up against you. But my gosh, your after is so great. Your mm -hmm. own business. I've been to your beautiful apartment. And God has given you a, a wonderful God's man as a husband. Praise God. And so, <laughs> Elder McCargo. So, uh, you know, we've talked. And yeah. we know you are a praise leader, a worship leader. How did you get into that? <laughs> um, actually, it had to be God because I had no desire, dream to even be a praise and worship leader. I, I just wanted to, you know, I got saved, um, wow, over, going on 30 years now. And um, I just wanted to be saved and go to heaven. I didn't have any desires to do anything. Um, they knew I came from, I was signed to Death Row Records, and that's what I moved to California. Um, and then, of course, everyone knows that story. Um, no, I, we uh, don't know that story, but that's well, how you started yeah, off as def, a secular yeah, I signed, artist. I was, a R &B, I was on, in the first R&B group signed to Death Row Records. Wow. Um, and uh, so everything went awry with Death Row um, and basically oh, yeah. with our contract and what have you. So basically I walked away from the contract. And, um, and at the time, you know, I was invited to a church. And I, you know, I went a few times and then I, I was like, something's going on because I would be in there and I would cry. I was just crying. Mm. I'm like, why am I crying? So then um, one Sunday, um, I said, I want to be saved. And my, uh, my, spiritual, my spiritual mother, uh, um, evangelist uh, Frances Lakey, she was preaching and she preached a message that God would dismiss you from his table if you do not do what he has called you to do. Wow. And so, and he, she used the analogy of, of, of said, Preacher, sitting at the table, you're not doing what I want you to do, get up, come here, drug dealer. Say, evangelist, you're not doing what you're supposed to do, come, get up, come here, prostitute, and put them at the table to do what they're supposed to do. And I wow. said, well, I would, rather, I would rather walk to God than to be rolled to God in a gurney. Wow. So after that, I, was, I just want to be saved. So I wasn't a hocus pocus, oogly boogly right. situation. It was just, I just made a conscious decision. And after that, you know, um, they, there was a choir. They said, join the choir. I got in the choir. They figured I could teach a song. I don't know what made them think that. And um, so Maybe I taught them. Because you used to be a professional. Yeah, I guess. And I was like, <laughs> but I know people that are in groups that can't teach. But okay. they, I guess they figured I could. 
So I um, taught a song, went over well, as we teach another song, went over well. We um, did some uh, street witnessing uh, with a, a, a sister church in Vegas. We were about to leave, um, and they said, hey, let the choir, the choir join together and sing a song. They said, okay, well, all the directors are gone. Well, who's going to direct the choir? And somebody pushed me in my back and said, be a director. So we direct, I directed the song, and the Holy Ghost fell into place. And so we got, that was on a Saturday. We drove back to L.A., got to church. They told the pastor, hey, we did this song yesterday, and God blessed us. Well, we said, do it again. So we did it again. Church was wrecked. They said, you're the new minister of music. <laughs> so I became, you know, the choir director, and um, <clears throat> they tried to push me to do praise and worship. I'm like, I don't want to do praise and worship. I don't want to do I don't want to do that. I just, I just want to, you know, direct, and that's it. Um, and then uh, what pushed me, what made me finally just say, yes, I'll do um, praise and worship, was when my, um, my son was murdered. He, my son, I had a 17-year-old son, Brennan, and he was murdered. And the only thing that kept me alive was me leading praise and worship. Because when I, while I was leading worship, I wasn't in any, any pain. Um, it was like a, it was like, a, like I said, the anointing, it's an ointment, and it just soothed me, and it, it just gave me so much comfort. And then, of course, once the anointing lifted, you know, but once I, once I was in worship, I felt nothing. I felt no pain. That's I, the balm just, of Gilead. Yeah, and it, it was just, I just felt like that, that healing sash. And so, um, yeah, so after that, uh, I caught the attention of uh, um, uh, Dr. Iris Stevenson. And she came to a rehearsal, and she said, and I was directing the choir, she said, if you, she said, if you trust me, I'll make your name great in this church, and it's under Church of God in Christ. So I started directing on a national level, and that opened up doors for me to travel around the country, teaching workshops, and on um, choirs at first. Then it branched off into praise and worship. And believe it or not, I, don't, I haven't told many people this, Dr. Judah McAllister tried to make, tried to push me to do, be a praise and worship leader, and I completely ignored her because I did not see that for myself. But now I'm like, you know what? I want an apology. <laughs> so, and, you know, and she saw in me that something that I didn't see. And um, so here I am now, and that's what I do. Um, just I, my job is to set the atmosphere for the preach word to go forth. Uh, and I, I love what you just said. I mean, you said so much. I'm going to come back to setting the atmosphere for mm -hmm. the preach word because I am really big on that. Mm -hmm. I think atmosphere is Absolutely. seriously everything. Absolutely. You said a couple of things, and we have people watching, mm -hmm. and I think you can um, give them some healing because you talked about your, um, your son, mm -hmm. your 17-year-old son being murdered yeah. and how praise is what, it was like a bomb to yes. you. Yes. So seriously, if you were, I, I want you to look in your camera mm -hmm. and give somebody some hope who's had a son or a daughter that has been tragically taken. Well, we, um, in this life, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. All we do is just trust in God, and that's in the good and the bad. And un unfortunately, when my son was murdered, uh, I happened to be, in ministry, and I, when my son was murdered, I was at church. So me and God had a real problem, and um, I got outside of the religion thing. I got so outside of the church thing, and it was me and God, and I was upset with God because I said, I'm doing your will, doing your work, and you allow my only child to die by himself. He was shot at point-blank range, and his friends ran off and left him, and he died by himself, and I was supposed to be there to protect my son. And so from that point, me and God was on a pre pretty rocky stage for a few months. And then I was, I was literally losing my mind because I was so angry. And I would go to bed every night and make sure all my clothes were washed and clean so that when I woke up, well, I wasn't planning on waking up the next morning because I didn't want to live. Um, but then at the same time, then it was something I, I had a breakdown. And it was like a voice came to me and said, will you still serve me? Wow. And I, and I, and it was the craziest thing because I look at it, I still think about it now. I'm like, he's, it just said, will you still serve me? And I went, yeah. And I got back in my car, drove home. I was having a, I was having a breakdown in the parking lot of a food for less grocery store. All I had on was a pair of jeans, a tank top t-shirt, and my Timberland boots. And 
I was losing my mind because I couldn't believe what would happen to me. But at the same time, once God changed me and delivered me then, after that, I went full steam. So it became a thing of me helping other people get through the, a dark time in my life. And the crazy part about it is that when I found out my son was murdered, the first thing that I did, I went to church and I fell on the altar and I started worshiping God. And that had to be from the spirit that was in me because me as a natural person, I don't think I would have done that. Mm. But at the same time, if you just trust God, even in your darkest hour, I'm a witness. I am a, I'm a poster boy that God can bring you through it. And also what comes with that too, especially if you've lost a, a, a child, sibling, <clears throat> anyone, to, to countless senseless, senseless murder. The thing is, you have to forgive that person. You have to forgive that person. The Bible says, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So therefore, if you don't forgive them, God won't forgive you. And no one is worth you going to hell over. So wow. it becomes a thing of letting them go. But it cannot be done by your own natural power. It has to be the power of the Holy Ghost that, that is inside of you. So if you're not filled with the Spirit of God now, I, am, I implore you to seek the Holy Ghost, be filled with the Holy Ghost, and that with the evidence of speaking in tongues, and God will begin that healing process, and he will be able, and then once you are able to get over it, and will not get over it, get through it, because you never get over it. You get through it. You learn. It's like constant back pain. It's, ne it's always there. Some days it doesn't hurt as bad as others. But at the same time, you can be a witness to God's healing power. And you will say, and the people will look at you and say, wow, if he did it for him, he can do it for you. And that's exactly what I, that's the life that I live now. Because I'm like, if I made it through my son being murdered, I can make it through anything. Wow. You know, that is uh, such a, uh, an awesome word of encouragement and hope uh, for people, no matter what they're going through. Mm -hmm. And you said something about forgiveness, and I just was counseling a young lady yesterday, uh, going through a, a horrible divorce, and I told, I mean, she has two children, and I told her, listen, what you don't forgive, you give. You have to forgive him, because otherwise you're going to pour that poison mm -hmm. down into your child. But for something like that, sometimes people pour poison into their own Heart. It actually causes sickness. It can yeah. actually yes. cause death. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. of the yeah. simple fact, it's in. It's a. It's like a cancer. Yeah. That eats at you. It's like it's even down to the point of you say you've forgiven someone, but the mention of their name, your mood changes. You haven't forgiven them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I. I. Well, I don't deal with them anymore. No, you haven't forgiven them. That's. That's. That's a good word. That, get, that, wow. makes, that makes a that, lot of people, some, like they say in church, they sometimes you can't say amen, say ouch. Yeah, wow. Yeah. I think a whole lot of people are saying ouch right now. But that <laughs> led, though, to an awesome ministry of praise that you travel throughout this country, um, leading praise workshops. And you said a couple things to me um, over our, our, our <laughs> conversation. Yeah. Talk to us about praise, and you know this is where uh, Dee Dee. I, I was on our praise team. One of the one of the most awesome ministers of music that ever lived. His name mm -hmm. was uh, Clarence C. Dub Williams, mm -hmm. and uh, awesome, awesome. And and so I know the the I know praise. I know the. I know the ministry of praise, but I also know the worship yes. of praise. Mm -hmm. So I tell you said some profound things yesterday about if you're praise, if you haven't done a couple of things, talk to us about praise. Uh, well, honestly, I'm a product of Dr. Todd M. Hall, who okay. is a praiseologist. Okay. So, <laughs> okay, you know, praiseologist. And, yes, and he teaches, he says, open mouths, open doors. Okay. So therefore, you know, people say, I love, I say, I praise God in my heart. No, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yes. So therefore, you have, to, you have to open your mouth and give God praise. People start clapping their hands, but they never open their mouth. And one thing that I do when I lead worship, I said, don't allow your hand clap to be louder than your mouth. Ooh. Don't that let your awesome. hand clap. Don't, your hand clap should not be louder than your mouth. And I always challenge people. I say, if you don't have... If you don't have cancer of the throat or laryngitis, open up your mouth and give God glory. Yeah. Wow. Simple as that. And it becomes a thing of you, and the Bible says, David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. Yes. At all times. So therefore, blessing him 
is not with your hands. Yeah. Blessing him is with your mouth. Out of your okay. mouth, you speak, you, you speak wonderful things of God. Yeah. And at the same time, the Bible says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not its benefits. There are benefits Ooh. in blessing God. When you bless him out of your mouth, that means that you're making a deposit. Once you make a deposit, then you can make a withdrawal. But mm. you can't get a withdrawal if you've never made a deposit. Oh my God! Yes, we got you. You, you <laughs> never, you never can make a withdrawal if you don't make a deposit. So, therefore, and I believe praise, praise. We praise God for what He's done, but we worship God for who He is. Yeah. Praise catapults you into worship. Pra and worship is not a cool down session from yeah. praise. Right. Yes. People yeah. oftentimes they'll dance and shout and run and, and whatever, and then when it comes to worship, then they want to sit down. No. It's a, when you're praising God, you're getting closer and closer and closer and closer to him. And it's a thing you're praising him because his hands are here. And you're praising him and you're getting closer and closer and you're looking at his hands because that's praise. But then once you get in his face, it's worship. Therefore, you look at it, you're, in his, you're standing in front of him and he wraps his arms around mm. you. Mm -hmm. And then you can't even really look him in his face because his face is like a mirror and you see that you're not worthy. So that makes you drop your head in, in humility and say, God, I'm not worthy of your presence. I'm not worthy of what you've done for me. I'm not worthy even to be in your presence. But be, because you have done so, I must worship you. I must thank you. Regardless of what, I don't care if my lights are turned off, I'm going to worship you. My car note isn't paid, I'm going to worship you. My car got repossessed, I'm going to worship you. I have cancer in my body, but if I worship you, you can heal my body. Mm, 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 mm. You can heal my body. You can heal my mind. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Mental health is a real thing. Mental illness is a real thing. But if people would just tap into the Holy Ghost and tap yeah. into the anointing of God, yeah. he could change their entire life. What if... Mm. 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 If he's concerned... If, he, if he's concerned about a sparrow, yes. if he's concerned about flowers and, and basting them with beauty, mm -hmm. how much more? 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 See, this thing, and then the highest form of worship is a lifestyle. That's right. Oh, my gosh. Because you can sing, and I tell people all the time, it's not about the right note, it's about the right spirit. Because you can hit a high note and live a low life. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Mm. Wow. I'm not the, I promise you, I am not the best vocalist, but I promise you, no one will get in touch with God quicker than I will. Because I'm the worst person on this earth. I need God more than anybody I know. That's how I approach it. You, it's not a competition, but at the same time, I'm going after God as the deer panther for the water. Yes, right. Yes, yes, yes. Oof. And see, the wonderful thing is I have a witness. She know I'm like this at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I ain't Jesus Jr. We clown and do all that kind of stuff. But when I tap into God's glory, because yeah. mm. I start thinking, once you start thinking, you start thanking. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh. Once you start thinking, you start you mm. when I think when I'm my wife isn't around and I think about how beautiful she is, I just shake my head and I smile. I say, that girl fine. <laughs> she finer than frog's hair. But it's the same <laughs> thing with God. I'm like, God. Oh good. And I've had moments, and we've all had moments where it's like, God, I don't know how you're going to make a way. But it's say, I will supply all of your needs according to your riches and glory. And he's done it countless times. I've had situations, woke up in the morning and did not have a dime in my pocket, and I had a bill that needed to be paid. And by the end of the day, the Holy Ghost will remind me after that bill got paid, say he did it again. My gosh, and <clears throat> you know, this is, I, and I'm just like, I, I normally, as I'm interviewing, I'm like, but you are just ministering to our hearts, everybody out there, you're ministering, you're saying some things that are, are, are resonating hope within us, 
hope to be better. Yeah. Hope to be better at praise, at worship, at thanks at Thanksgiving. Yeah. yeah. Hope to be better at seeing God. Hope to be better in our faith. Yeah. Hope and don't do it at church. Do it at home. Yeah. Ooh, when there's no instruments around. There are no instruments around, there ain't no lights, camera, action. It's just you, God, your situation, you, oh, God, yeah. the devil, your situation, and your voice. Mm -hmm. If you just praise. open your mouth and just start saying, thank you, yeah. mm -hmm. it changes the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. David was the best example. Mm -hmm. Every time that David played a harp, he chased away the evil spirits that yeah. God had placed on that. Saul. Yes. Right. So therefore, he was an atmosphere setter. So yeah. therefore, our heart is in our mouth. That's yes. right. When we open our mouths, we should be able to change the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. That's why we should be slow to speak. Because mm. when we open our mouths, we set an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. With me sitting here right now, I've changed the atmosphere. Not only have you changed the atmosphere, and I know that our time is about up. <laughs> We're going to have you back. No, don't you, be, don't you dare be sorry. The word of God talks about how, I think it was Samuel, that mm -hmm. his words did not fall to the ground. They don't fall, no. None of your words have fallen to the ground. They have been readily received. And this is one of my shows that I'm like, my gosh, I wish we had a whole <laughs> nother hour. But I do have to get you guys back. I, yes, I have to. to be honest. I have to I bring you back. Cause I, and I also know that you travel the country yes, doing workshops, worship and praise workshops. And so your number is showing on the screen. So, because there's a lot of pastors that watch this, and I know your schedule is full too, and you're not <laughs> looking to be booked. But nevertheless, there are some pastors out there, you know, that, this, that God's calling you. To have this man, Praise this, God. this man of God at, at, at your church. I'm going to give you have this final word, and then we are totally out of time. <laughs> <clears throat> um, we're just honored to be here. Um, like I said before, just always, you know, regardless of your situation, never stop praising God. Never stop praising God. Even when you don't feel like it, if you just open up your mouth and say two words, thank you. I, I'm going to ask you to give a final word to all the praise leaders and the people on praise teams out there, because I know you've encouraged everybody, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people that lead praise or just on the praise team. And I'd like you to close with a word for them, and then I'll come back and give our closing pr prayer. Well, praise teams, praise teams, you are praise leaders. You have that one person that is leading the song, but everyone on the team is a leader. So therefore, you have the same uh, uh, disciplines that the leader has. You have the same mantle. You have the same uh, discipline that you, that same discipline must be followed by everyone on the team, having your own personal relationship with God. And also remembering your job. The job of a praise and worship leader is to work their way out of a job. The way you work your way out of a job is where you take the people to where they need to be and you no longer matter. That's right. They're not focused on your vocals. They're not focused on you. Oftentimes when I lead worship, I walk off and they don't even know I'm gone because mm. everyone is into worship. Praise God. And I'll tell you this, and this is for free, and I'm going to promise you I'm going to close. Those of us that witness the space shuttle over time, the space shuttle, when the space shuttle is, goes into orbit, the space shuttle is taken into orbit by what? Two rockets. The camera follows the space shuttle and the rockets into orbit. Once the space shuttle has met, his, has gotten to its destination, what happens to the rockets? The rockets fall off back to the ground. They serve their purpose. The space shuttle, the camera stays on the space shuttle, but the camera doesn't focus on the rockets. We are the rockets. We go back to the Earth to be used again. And if we, long as we know that we are the, we are the perfect, the, our purpose is to unify the house, having everyone say the same thing at the same time in the same spirit. Very simple, simple songs. Great is the Lord and great is to be praised. If everyone said that at the same time with the same spirit, God will come in because he operates in oneness. And I'll leave that alone because we can oh go Oh, my gosh. Yeah, because we, 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 we have to go, but my <laughs> God. And we could have got into that one accord and oneness. That, yeah, oh, yeah. But like I said, yeah. we'll have you come back. I, I am so um, pleased and honored that you chose.
to, to be here tonight to hear DeAndrea McCargo's story. No matter how you start, there's a other side. And once again, on the other side of the dimness and even the darkness, there is the light of Jesus. And so we're going to end for tonight, but I dare not end tonight of all times without giving you the opportunity to invite Jesus into your heart. I just know that someone has uh, been, you're in a desperate situation and you're there by yourself. Uh, somebody's just in a situation with a, a child. Maybe your child is still alive, but they might as well be dead to, get to the Lord. There's so much. But if you've never invited Jesus into your heart, I said this on my Facebook Live today, not, you want Jesus not just as some fire insurance, okay? It's not that you mm. want to get to heaven with your rope smoking. <laughs> you want Jesus to be your Savior, but you want to also want him to be your Lord so that you can honor him as Lord. And if that's you, I'm going to pray a prayer that you can pray and invite Jesus into your heart to be your Savior and Lord. You can bow your head and pray. Lord Jesus, I need you. I open the door of my heart, and I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I ask, Lord, that you would forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, please come into my heart. Take control of my life and make me the kind of person you want me to be. Amen. If you pray that prayer, Jesus is in your heart. He's there to say, he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never turn my back on you. Elder McCargo, while I was praying, God gave me an idea. We're going to have some, have a live audience oh, and have you come and lead us in a time of praise and worship. Praise so God. we amen. will look, yeah, and everybody is saying amen. <laughs> so God. we will work out a date for that. Yes, ma'am. Dee Dee, yes, ma I am so grateful to God for your story. Thank you so much. Once again, this is her book. There's still more to your story, still. And there's more to your story. Yes, and you're is. you're in the you're it's, it, you're you're it, 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 I don't even see how it can get better and better. But we know with Jesus, life can't get sweeter and sweeter. Amen. She's Thank my she's my hero. She's your ah, that's she's so hero. nice. And and before we came on, I was listening to all the wonderful accolades that you have given, <laughs> and all the accolades that she's given you. Okay, so a um, little bit over time, but thank you for joining us. And we'll see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>